So my name is Paul Hendrick. I'm the Director of Capital Investments for Irish Rail. Um, the title of today's presentation is Decarbonising Ireland's Railway. Um, what I'm going to try and cover is give you a bit of an insight into the Irish Rail system, the network, how the business is structured, and then take you through, I suppose, the various programmes and projects and long-term initiatives that we're looking at to develop the railway and ultimately to decarbonise the railway. Uh, and just a small bit by way of background, um, I'm a mechanical engineer by training, multidisciplinary engineer by practice. Project delivery is my background. Uh, I started with the client organisation. I worked on the original Dublin Lewis Light Rail Scheme back in the early noughties. was responsible for the commissioning of the new rolling stock fleet. Worked in operations to set up the mobilisation of Transdev uh, and the maintenance organisations there. Uh, then I worked with uh, main contractors including Lang O'Rourke, who I worked with for 10 years in Ireland and on the, in the UK. I uh, worked with CISC, who would be uh, uh, the main leading contractor in Ireland, and I joined the Irish Rail business two years ago. So including the Lewis project, I've worked on ESB network renewals in the early noughties, where we were renewing 28,000 kilometres of 10 kV overhead lines distribution networks across the country. Uh, worked on various light rail extensions in Dublin for the main contractor. Uh, worked on Manchester Metrolink for five years uh, with Langer Work in the main consortium team that trebled the size of Manchester Metrolink, it was about 36 kilometres when we arrived. When we finished, it's over 100. That's obviously a full 750 volt DC system. Uh, I went back to Ireland, I worked on Lewis Cross City between 2015 and 2017. And that was effectively to connect the two Lewis lines that were originally severed because they were deemed to be too difficult. Um, so I worked on that for three years, the project director. Uh, so I've done a, quite a bit around electrified <coughs> rail infrastructure, albeit predominantly in the light rail sector. So in terms of presentation for today, just to give you at the high level structure of it, um, I'll talk mainly about what we're doing in the Dublin Area Commuter Network, the DART program, that's Dublin Area Rapid Transit. Um, I'll also talk about what we're doing in Cork, um, in the south of the country. I'll touch on what we're doing on the Enterprise Line, that's the Dublin Belfast Intercity Service that we operate with our colleagues in Northern Ireland. And I'll speak a little bit about some of the other uh, operations that we have in Ross Lair Europort, which we'll explain later, rail freight, and ultimately what are our long-term decarbonisation goals. So a bit of the corporate stuff first. So uh, just in terms of our, the Irish Rail business and the network, how we set up, I suppose we're a bit like what GBR is going to become. We just didn't make the transition when you guys did in the 90s, so <coughs> we've stayed the same. So we have, we have the benefits of the integrated model, where we're effectively the train operating company, we're the TOC, we're the Roscoe, uh, <coughs> we're the network rail, and we're the capital projects all, all in one roof. Network and services, carrying about a million passengers <coughs> weekly, uh, 5,000 train services on a weekly basis, about 630 carriages in the fleet, uh, just about 4,400 employees. And that includes a direct labour organisation for managing the train operations business and managing the infrastructure maintenance as well. 2,200 kilometres in our network, 145 stations nationwide. So this slide, similar stats, so I'm, I'm, I'm only using it to just explain the network just to um, help to get your bearings. So coming out of Dublin then, we've got the intercity line to Belfast. Uh, again, that's a cross-border enterprise that we run with Northern Ireland Railways. Coming out of Dublin, then really the, the jewel in the crown for us is the Dublin to Cork main line. So you see it running in the southwesterly direction. That's really the spine of our network between Dublin, Belfast, Dublin, Cork. Uh, we then have other intercity lines from Dublin to Waterford where we come off the Cork line. Um, and then we have a, a branch to Limerick. We have a branch off that line to Tralee and Kerry. Uh, and then if we look at the west, we've got branch lines coming off that main Cork line going to Galway and going to Westport and Ballina and Mayo. And then we have a dedicated uh, line from Dublin to Sligo. And obviously we've got commuter traffic on those lines in and out of Dublin and same with Cork uh, and some of the other regions also. So uh, some people in the room might be familiar with some elements of our network, some may not, so this may be news to some people. Uh, total island of Ireland, that includes uh, Translink, Northern Ireland Railways and ourselves, uh, just over 2,300 2, kilometres. Uh, of heavy rail network. We have the glory of the Irish gauge, courtesy of a parliament decision in the 19th century that gave you guys the 1435 mil rail, just like your European colleagues, and left us with 1600 mil 543 uh, rail gauge. That's what we have to live with, that's life. Um, we built a Lewis light rail system that apparently was wrong because we built a 1435 mil gauge. The public weren't too happy with that, that the idea that we can't connect it to the, uh, to the main lines, but there you go, can't keep everyone happy all the time. 
Uh, effectively, as I was saying, it's primarily a radial system to and from Dublin. Um, I suppose the bit that I still find hard to get my head around is we have a double track line really from Dublin to Cork and Belfast, but the majority of the rest of the network is single track. And that wasn't like we built it single track originally, it was twin track, we deconstructed it with the advent of the private car in the 50s and the 60s. Um, and what a decision to make, and that's something that we're going to have to correct in the longer term. So just a little bit about the actual DART network uh, and the overall network. And again, this is a bit of a tragic statistic, but we only have 3% of our route network electrified. 3%. We're so far behind everyone in Europe, and we are part of Europe. Um, and <laughs> is that that point? And we're so far behind you guys. You guys are worried about where you're at. You're doing really well as far as we're concerned. You're at, what, 40% plus by mileage? We're just, like, we may as well be at zero. Um, we're primarily a DMU railway, totally reliant on diesel operations. As we said, I talked about the Dublin Lewis lines, which are managed separately. They're not part of our business. They report into the Department of Transport separately. Obviously, they're a 750 volt DC tram line, just like the tramways here in the UK. Um, we built the original uh, DART system, which was taking us out of the centre of Dublin, south down the coast, as far as Bray. Um, I'm, just, I'm not sure if I got a pointer here. But, oh. um, down as far as Bray and north towards Holt Head, which kind of effectively takes the railway around Dublin Bay. Um, I suppose just another interesting statistic is the first railway that was built was from the centre of Dublin to Dunleary Harbour, which is on the line to Bray. Uh, which is known as Kingstown at the time. That was the first passenger railway uh, in Ireland and it was the first commuter railway in the world uh, that was opened in 1834. And it's along that network that was electrified in the early 1980s and then that was extended further to take us out to 50 kilometres. We brought it out as far as Malahide. We're still operating the same rolling stock since 1983 on that network, 40 years service and count and still operating to this day. Um, so then in terms of the, um, the company structure, this is a very simplified slide, but we've got the board, we've got the CEO. As I said, we've an integrated model. That's the one benefits we have, I suppose. And the way the business is then divided, uh, there's the railway undertaking business, and this is following the EU uh, legislative requirement for the structure of the organisation, which is effectively our TOC, our train operations business. The rolling stock business unit sits within that, so that manages all the rolling stock maintenance and renewals. The CME business, which used to be a standalone business in its own right over the years, they report in through the, uh, the RU business. Then we have the infrastructure manager, who's basically managing all the maintenance renewals across all of the track uh, structures uh, and also the signalling and overhead line systems and substations. And then we have a capital investments unit, which was only reformed about six years ago. Uh, historically, we always had a capital uh, delivery unit, but given the severity of austerity that we suffered, given the severity of how we suffered with the financial crisis, obviously our capital flows were turned off entirely. And whilst they were restructuring the business to the RU and the infrastructure manager, they reversed the capital investments unit into the IM. And given the direction of travel of coming out of that and where Ireland is at at the moment, and obviously all the work that needs to be delivered, a decision was taken back in 2017 to reverse it back out as a separate separate unit. So all new projects, all capital spend goes through the capital investments unit. The mechanical engineering division, all their new projects, all their new fleets, they report through me. And for all the train operations and maintenance, they report through the director of the railway undertaking. So in summary, I suppose this slide is just sort of given a, a neat summary. This is how I see it in the yellow box, or you and I am. Those guys are managing today's railway. Our job in the green box, which is to drive all the infrastructure programs, projects, and new train fleets is to prepare for tomorrow's railway. So the DART program, what is it? Um, so Dublin Area Rapid Transit, as I said, the 50 kilometer line that we've had in operation since the early 80s. Um, we, this is gonna be the largest rail investment scheme in the history of the state. Probably doesn't seem that big by, you know, over, from your point of view, it decides the program you, you guys are delivering. Three billion plus investment. And essentially what they're looking to do is to treble the size of the network from 50 to 150 kilometers to take that network out along that Dublin Cork line that I pointed out, out along the Dublin Sligo line and up the Belfast line as far as Drogheda to offer electrified commuter services to decarbonize those current diesel services that we see today. It's also to develop capacity. We want to double the capacity of the railway so there's a lot of resignaling. We want to go from 26,000 to 52,000 passengers per hour in terms of capacity. And we've also, and I'll touch on this in some of the slides later on, we've basically signed a framework agreement for the largest, greenest, 
uh, fleet contract in the history of the state, and we've signed that with Alstom at the end of 2021. And this project isn't about just about the greater Dublin area, which is what you know this area serves. So it goes outside of Dublin, it goes into the neighbouring counties. It also will add benefits to the whole network in terms of capacity improvements that it will create. This slide, a uh, lot of similar, uh, similar messages in this, but I suppose just to explain how we're going to deliver this big program, we've broken it down into an infrastructure program and a fleet program. And in the infrastructure program, we've broken it down into a number of projects. At the bottom, you'll see DART Plus West, which basically takes us out the Sligo line uh, as far as Maynooth, where we will also have a, a brand new EMU depot. Uh, then we have the South West line, which is basically electrifying out the Cork line as far as Kildare. Uh, then we have DART Coastal North, which is going up the, the coastal line north uh, towards Belfast, but obviously stopping at Trada, which is a, a, a regional commuter town uh, on the coast. And then in terms of dark coastal south from the Greystones to the city centre, it is already electrified, but we are looking to improve the capacity. So there's a, a lot of infrastructure work we're planning to do with that as well. So dark plus west, uh, just a quick overview on it. It's 40 kilometres of electrification. Ultimately, it's about getting from six trains per hour to 12 trains per hour in the peak. Uh, new state-of-the-art maintenance depot uh, and stabling facilities for all of the EMU fleet, including the existing EMU fleets that operate today in Maynooth, new train station at Spencer Dock, which is in the city, which has an interchange with the Lewis Light Rail Scheme, and ultimately it's about decarbonising those diesel commuter train services uh, and replacing them with new uh, electric DART Plus trains. So we've called the programme DART Plus, just to distinguish it from the existing DART. Just a couple of images, so primarily getting from six trains per hour to 12, improving that capacity on that line from 5,000 to 13,000 passengers, 40 kilometres of overhead electrification, 12 new substations, and we do need to close level crossings because we're going from six trains per hour to 12. Those level crossings will be closed more than they're open. That is a challenging piece of work for us, obviously, with the, in the public consultation with the community, um, but it's a necessity to deliver the, the enhanced level of public transport service on that line. Brand new uh, train station at Spencer Dock. Uh, so we, there's a station, an old station nearby. We're going to relocate it for the brand new one, which will be a full interchange with Dublin's Lewis Light Rail system. And, and a huge part of what we're trying to do is improve the integration in Ireland's public transport network uh, with our projects, as well as the other, um, the other businesses who are involved in public transport. Enhancements to Conley Station, which is our main, uh, our main hub. And we've got bridge reconstructions and modifications on that route. We're trying to do a lot of track lowering to minimize uh, bridge work as part of the overhead lines. Uh, brand new state of the art depot. This will be the biggest depot uh, we will have when it's built. It's 36 hectare site. It's a massive site from uh, from our uh, experience of the depots we currently operate today, um, and that will be delivered as part of this Dark Plus uh, West project. There's some of the uh, just again some of the photo montages. Huge amount of stabling capacity that we need to plan for the longer term. So Dark Plus South West again. Similar, similar model, uh, this is split up as a separate project. This is to take the electrification uh, down the Cork line from Houston Station. Uh, it's about 20 kilometres all in, including the connection from uh, DART Plus West, which I'll explain now in a second. Uh, again, increasing capacity will also involve some four tracking. We have four tracking on the Cork line, but not from Houston. Uh, out. There's about five kilometres missing that we wanted to do 20 years ago, but we didn't have the funding to do it. So we need to correct that as part of this, and that'll obviously help us to manage intercity and commuters. New station at Houston West, same idea again. So there, just just a, an image of the route. If you just see the uh, the orange there, connection with the green, that's where effectively it connects with the Sligo line. There's there's an old cutting and a tunnel where we run cross city services today. We'll electrify through that tunnel, and then the services will join effectively the Cork main line pretty much at the Houston station. It's only about 300 metres away from the terminus. <coughs> Uh, and then that'll give us a, a DART system out as far as Selbridge in Kildare. Same idea as we talked about, 20 kilometres, six new substations, and then obviously we do need to electrify through the tunnel section that goes under the Phoenix Park. Uh, then there's the four kilometre of the corridor widening that I, that I spoke about as well, and various new bridge <coughs> reconstructions that we'll have to do as part of that four tracking element. So then Dark Coastal North, um, so this is again, same idea, uh, taking the existing Dark Line from Malahide uh, in Dublin uh, and taking it north as far as Drogheda, it's just about 37 kilometres, um, which I should have on the next slide. Eight substations, one bridge reconstruction, again, all about getting from six to 12 services per hour and electrifying to decarbonise the existing diesel commuter services that run there today. 
These are just some of the modifications, to, and we will improve some of the resilience around turnbacks uh, and stabling on uh, sections of that route to again help manage the increased service frequency. And in coastal south, we will look to reinfor reinforce the overhead line uh, power capacity in, in this line as part of this project. It is already electrified. We will look to improve the capacity from 6 to 12 trains per hour as part of this programme of work as well. And as I said, the level crossings, just the image with the red circles, they're, they're probably our greatest challenge because that's a, a, a key part of the city where there's a lot of traffic flows. So how are we, I suppose, how are we securing the planning and consent that we need for this, statutory consent for these big schemes and funding? So, you know, as I said, we've broken it out into four projects. It's managed within one big program hub team. Uh, just at the very top, you'll see DAR Plus West. We have lodged for a railway order. We have to go through a, a board called On Board Planola, which is basically like a national planning board governed by statute. Uh, so we've lodged our railway order application uh, in the summer just gone. We're hoping to get a decision by the end of the year. And we've also just lodged DAR Plus South West as in a month ago. And hopefully get a decision next year on that. And then we're working towards lodging railway orders for DAR Plus Coastal North and our first coastal south over the course of the next 18 months. So the other big part of the DARPLUS program, and it's probably the one that's the, the most visual for the public, is the new DARPLUS train fleet. You'll see a picture of Peter Smith, our chief mechanical engineer, uh, Jim Mead, our CEO on the left, and the, uh, the chief executive of Alstom, Henry Poupard Lafarge, signing the uh, framework agreement in 2021, which is for 750 new uh, electric rail carriages. So there's, there's a 10 year framework agreement. Um, this is one that's planning for the long term. This is the best way to do it. Give us the best value, the best economies, no minimum order quantity. So it's called a zero value framework agreement. So we're not obliged to order any or all of the sets. Uh, we've ordered 185 carriages already. We expect to draw down the whole order over the rest of the course of this decade. But the most interesting feature here is we've actually procured the capability to buy them as EMUs or we can buy them as battery electric multiple units. They're both the exact same train set. The BEMUs and EMU at the end of the day will operate like one in the electrified network except it has an off-wire capacity of up to 80 kilometres. Uh, we're, we're probably more at the forefront of this than maybe we had appreciated. When we look around where things are at in Europe, there's a lot of talk about this. There's actually not as much of this actually being committed and implemented as, as you might think. Um, out at the edge is not where we like to be. Um, but that's where we are. And we've bought these fleets. They're coming. We've burned the boats. Right? We have ordered 13 five-car train sets, which we are going to put into service at the end of 2025 on the Northern Line to Drogheda, even though we're electrifying, because, because of the capital funding flow, we can't do all those projects at the same time. We won't get to Drogheda until beyond 2030 in reality but we can get it decarbonised, we can start the decarbonisation process earlier. We are building battery charging infrastructure at Drogheda, uh, we, we are building energy storage at Drogheda as well to allow for a charging time of 18 minutes uh, on a turnaround. There's just some images of the train sets. Um, they're the articulated vehicles, again, not unlike the, the Lewis uh, tram vehicles that we have in Dublin, so this is a bit of a departure for Irish Rail in terms of the vehicle formation. Um, but again, uh, very much designed around accessibility, being much more user friendly, uh, and to be able to be of appeal to the wider community. Uh, they come in five car sets, or we can order them in 10 car sets. We've ordered them in five car sets uh, so far, but they can be ordered in five or 10 car formation, and we can operate them as two five cars coupled. So this is a phrase that was coined uh, inside the business. I'm not taking credit for it, it was somebody else. And it's now been kind of coined quite a lot uh, around, let's say, the, the public discourse and, and helps to drive, I suppose, behaviours and momentum. Various strategy documents we've put in place, which has been really important to put strategies out there, even though people aren't always going to subscribe to what we're saying. If you don't put these strategy documents out there, it's very hard to get the traction around what you're doing. So we've a 2027 strategy, we've a rail freight 2040 strategy, we're responsible for rail freight as well as a company and a sustainability strategy. And I suppose... The challenge that we face is to deliver all of this work in the short term and is termed a decade of delivery of what we need to do between now and 2030 uh, to move this agenda forward. So that's just showing you the DARP Plus uh, extended network there in the orange lines. As I said, uh, you'll see the Hoth to Greystone's line is the existing line but uh, and beyond Malahide, but you'll see it extending out west and southwest. And it's just a summary slide of some of the stats that I've already called out. 
that's uh, lodging the railway order, um, which was a big achievement in itself. Everyone knows how much work goes into preparing a, rail a railway order application or a bill of parliament. Um, South West gone in, and then we're working on the design process at the moment on all the other lines. So I talked about the battery charging infrastructure. So we've ordered, um, we've ordered 13 five-car train sets and six five-car train sets, which six of them are EMUs. They'll go into service on the existing network. We've ordered 13 five-car battery electric multiple units, which will operate from Connolly under the overhead wires as far as Malahide. Pantograph will drop. It'll operate then on battery from Malahide to Drada. It gets a charge at Drada on the turnaround, comes back, Pantograph down, hits Malahide, Pantograph up into Connolly. So half the network on the south, it runs electrified. The other half of the run on battery power. And that's, I suppose, the big goal for us now is to look at that and see whether we should deploy that more, pending the fact that the infrastructure is where the real big lumpy investment is. It, we all know it's going to take time. There are risks with it around planning and funding. So this is something we're looking at to see how, how can we offer earlier decarbonisation of our services to our customers, to the public. Uh, and it gives us an option. It gives us optionality. So that was the loop. Uh, just to go to Cork, which is Ireland's second city, although to the people of Cork is known as the real capital. <laughs> um, so look, I mean, and Cork rightly would say that, you know, Dublin always gets looked after. Dublin sucks in all the capital, all the money, all the effort, all the resources. Uh, Cork is a growing city. Um, and we have an existing diesel network there from Mallow. If you look at the top of the screen down as far as Kent, that's on the main line. So it's about 30 kilometres on that Dublin to Cork main line where we've intercity services, but we also run a commuter service from Mallow into Cork Kent Station. Then we go out east of Kent, out as far as Middleton to the east of Cork, and then to Cove, south of Cork, which is where we have a lot of ships and uh, uh, cruise liners and the like. And then you see a line going in purple at the top, west out to Kerry, that's the Tralee line I mentioned earlier. We were operating one train per hour. We upped that to two trains per hour last year, and the, uh, the impact was massive. I mean, literally, the impact on ridership went up in a way that people actually had underestimated. The goal of this project is twofold. One, our diesel fleet is life expired. We have to renew the existing diesel fleet there. It's in operation since early, early 90s. And I suppose what we're trying to explain here in the government is a significant amount of the €1 billion Euro capital investment here is just to maintain steady state. We cannot buy another diesel fleet and lock in for diesel for another 30 years post-2030. So we need to electrify this network. So we have an electrification project, new depot that's needed, new fleet obviously as well, and ultimately service improvements and update that to go from two trains per hour to six trains per hour. We're just in the throes of signing a resignaling contract where we'll resignal this network to create that 10 minute capacity. It's actually five minutes in the throat between Cork, Kent and Clunton, Middleton on that junction. And we've been given EU money to help stimulate this. So the first start of this program has been uh, given a head start by the EU <coughs> and then the rest of the funding will come from, from the government. And we want to deliver this by the end of the decade so that we again, similar to DART, it's not going to be called the CART. We haven't figured out what the, <laughs> what the name is going to be for it yet. Um, but uh, there's yeah, lots of uh, wisecracks about that. Um, so there's just a map of it, uh, just in terms of the route. We're also looking at building out another eight stations, and this has been developed in conjunction with Cork County Council. <laughs> Collaboration is key. We have to collaborate with the other public agencies. This is about really helping the people of Cork uh, and making it an attractive place to live. Uh, we have to look at decentralised uh, decentralisation. We can't. People can't all live in the Greater Dublin area. It doesn't have the capacity. Um, so we've lodged a railway order application for. We're going to twin track that line from. Glunton to Middleton, it's a single track, uh, and we're going to twin track that, and the rest of that network is twin tracked. Infrastructure, resignaling, and then electrification. Uh, cross border. Okay, so I, I said I'd touch on Dublin Belfast. So we operate a, a joint venture operation with Northern Ireland Railways that runs a two hourly intercity Dublin to Belfast service, and this has been in place for 70 years. Um, that's a picture of our current fleet that we're running at the moment. Our fleet has been in operation since the mid-90s. It will be life expired by the end of this decade. We need to renew the fleet. Uh, there's also a, a joint ambition to update from a two-hourly to an hourly service on that line from Dublin to Belfast. So we will need to order double the quantity of fleet that we've had. Um, I suppose the biggest challenge we have here is that in electrification, we're looking at 25 kV with Northern Ireland Translink from Belfast to Dublin. But that is complicated 
by the legacy of the 1500 volt DC network that we have today from Dublin to Malahide and that we will have to draw that, that we've com because we are committing to that, to get that delivered with the uh, 750 volt fleets that we have. Uh, we're looking at an electrification program long term from Drada, cross border, 25 kV AC. So the challenge we face is we have to buy a fleet. Politically, we're not going to get signed off to buy another diesel fleet. So we will need to. We're currently working on the design, development, and tender preparation to look at purchasing a bi-mode stroke, tri-mode fleet that goes into service as diesel battery or diesel DC battery, and that when it finishes its end state, it'll be converted at the tipping point when the 25 kV infrastructure has been delivered. On that main line, the diesel will be changed out for 25 kV AC, so it will finish as an AC-DC battery or AC-DC train. So this is quite a challenging project to work with. We're, this is where the real challenges of the lack of action and the chronic underinvestment over the last five, six decades are coming home to roost. But we have to solve it. We have to solve it, and it's forcing us. And in a way, that's a good thing. Uh, just briefly, we've delivered a new national train control centre. This is critical to our expansion and improvement of our rail network. Our central control facility is located at Conley Station. It was built in the 1970s. It's operating off technology from the 1970s. We need to modernise, we need to renew, we need to create capacity. We've built that building, so it's a, we had a civil building package, which is now done. We're now in the systems fit out uh, and software design phase. We're looking to have that in operation by end of 24, early 25, which is a critical linchpin in enabling us to deliver all the additional programmes of work that we're, that we're doing. So just coming into the last section of my presentation for the next few slides is just to look at, uh, at the big picture. So look, no different to UK, UK government, Ireland has net zero 2050 ambitions, just like everyone else. Uh, we've got a climate action plan. There's a demand to take 50% out uh, of our emissions by 2030. That's massively challenging for us. At the moment, diesel traction represents 83% of rail emissions for us, and that just goes back to everything I've just talked about. We are totally reliant on diesel at the moment. We have to shift away from it. We've got a climate action plan. We've got legislative mandates. The government can be sued by the public if this isn't delivered. Um, so there's lots of uh, strategic imperatives coming in on top of everyone. Uh, we've also developed a rail 2050 plan, a long-term vision for the rail network in a way that we've probably shied away from before because sometimes it kind of spooks the horses. But we've put the, this together, this rail 2050 vision. And... One good thing that has been going on is the All Ireland Rail Review, some of you may have heard, on Ireland, jointly between the Department of Transport, Department for Infrastructure, and effectively the Department DFT, uh, between Northern Ireland, UK, and ourselves. This All Ireland Rail Study looks at the entire network on the island of Ireland and looks at it and says, what does it need to be like for the next 100 years? It isn't published yet. It's been done. It's finished. There are some complications around getting it published. We hope it will be out this year, and that will help to give momentum uh, and an imperative to everyone to say this is the long-term plan there's a commitment at national level to deliver these programs of work uh, so i just wanted to call that out because when i come on to some of this long-term vision that i'm calling out from our rail 2050 plan we've managed to embed a lot of that into the all island rail review albeit it's managed by the department of transport we're just a participant we're not the owner of it and i suppose this is the context you know we look at the island of ireland our history 200 years ago we were up above up at eight million uh Obviously, everyone knows the story, uh, why we have the Irish diaspora in every country around the world. Uh, huge emigration to here and to the, the States and Australia and various other places. Really, we went through huge stagnation in the 20th uh, century. Then we had the advent of the private car, population decline, and there just wasn't that case for significant rail investment. But the growth that has gone on in the last 30 years, particularly with our entry into the EU, uh, not to stress that, too much, um, but it has brought enormous benefits, right? So we have to we have to acknowledge that uh, we've created an open economy. Foreign direct investment is a huge part, but that's our that's our sovereign wealth, FDI. We're generating a surplus as a country now. We've gone from a desperate deficit where we were on our knees. They reckon we're going to generate a deficit of up to 20 billion euro next year. The government now has a first world problem because there's massive pressure on it. Has 20 billion surplus is now trying to figure out how to manage expectations, but that should be a good thing in terms of the public investment that's required in the country. So we're heading for 6.2 million, long-term projection for the Republic, 2 million in the north, heading back to where we were. Aging population, like everybody has, this is the feature that we're all going to have to deal with in the Western world. Migration, obviously we will have net inward migration to help us to support our economy. We don't have the birth rates that we've had, nor does uh, any of the countries in the Western world. Uh, and obviously a big focus on compact development in around the cities, making them obviously sustainable cities to live and work in, and a key part of the, the national policy. Biggest crisis we have at the moment, 
And I see it somewhat over here, but not as much as housing. You know, we've kind of gone from crisis to crisis. We went from the financial crisis uh, to various kind of post uh, financial crisis to COVID. Then we have the war in Ukraine, macro inflation. Housing is actually the biggest one for us. The young people in Ireland, the housing is, it's become unaffordable. Developers are struggling to develop. Real issue is, is we keep trying to build around Dublin. We can't keep building around Dublin. To get a proper housing strategy, to make it a sustainable place for young people to live and, and rear their families, we're going to have to look at a much better integrated transport system, integrated infrastructure to help the economy. This is just becoming a no-brainer. A um, couple of last slides. Rosslare, your report. You're probably wondering, what's that doing in here? So this is a legacy going right back uh, to the 19th century with the Fishguard, Rosslare, uh, ferry crossing and the, how the railway was assembled. But Irish Rail are the owner and operator of Rosslare Europort, just down there in the southeast of the country, which is the closest port to Europe now. Uh, Post-Brexit trade has gone up four, five-fold. I'm not joking. The trade has gone up. Like, we've been taken aback. We were preparing for it. You know, so every downside is always an upside somewhere else, isn't there? Um, so, uh, this is the, like, so we're now having to do a master plan to develop this port infrastructure to prepare for this reality. Um, so we're, we're the Ports Authority, we manage all the, the, the port infrastructure, we have a, we've a business unit down there. So we have a big programme of work, again this is managed through our unit in the capital investments team. Um, so we have a master plan for the port, obviously we're doing a huge amount of post-Brexit border infrastructure that we have to improve on like a lot of other uh, uh, coastal areas in Europe. But the biggest thing that we're involved in, which might look like a sidebar and wondering why am I talking about this here, but when you think about what we just talked about, about electrical infrastructure to support decarbonisation. Offshore renewables, I mean, it's an untapped resource still for us in Ireland. I know it's started in lots of places in the world, including around the UK. We have a sea area that's seven times our land area. This is our oil, right? This offshore wind, we're only at the start of it. And the government rightly so are saying to us, we need to look at building an offshore renewable energy hub at Rosslair Europort, which has all of the core infrastructure, proximate to the Celtic Seas and out beyond to be able to support the renewable energy in industry in delivering those projects and maintaining those projects. So we're looking at a major project there to develop everything in the yellow area. We'll be reclaiming the sea, building out a huge new key wall, huge new assembly area alongside the operational port infrastructure. This naturally complements when we talk about decarbonisation, we have to decarbonise the electricity network to decarbonise the transport network. And this is one of those perfect fits as far as I see it. And then just looking at the national picture, as I said earlier, what are we looking at? We need, we're really focused on our journey times. Long term, we need to get our journey times intercity down. We need to get down to 90 minutes at Dublin to Galway, Dublin to Limerick, Dublin to Waterford, two hours down to, down to Cork. We're north of two and a half hours at the moment. Uh, to do that, we need to resolve the single track areas that I spoke about earlier. We need to address those bot bottlenecks. So we've got plans for long term plans for double tracking in various sections of the route, as you'll see there. Uh, to support those journey time ambitions that we have and improve the, level, the public transport offering and ultimately to decarbonise society. Separate slow from fast, I talked about the four-tracking earlier. We're looking at a long-term four-tracking project on the northern line to manage the conflict between the Enterprise and the Dark Plus project. And then that takes us out to decarbonisation. What's our long-term goal? We want to double-track and electrify 25 kV AC all those intercity lines, Dublin Cork, Dublin Limerick, Dublin Waterford, Dublin Galway, and eventually Dublin Sligo. And we're realists and pragmatists, right? So the branch lines, going back to the discussion earlier, the goal will be to get the intercity network done first. And when the rolling program is there, as Peter said, it'll probably come. But we're looking at, say, a hybrid battery option for the branch line, so that you'd have, again, not dissimilar to what I spoke about on the dark fleet. And we will have to look at hydrogen. I know this conference is not about hydrogen, doesn't want to speak about it, but we will be forced to look at it, and we will need to consider it, and we are considering it in places. Lastly, rail freight. We have a rail freight business. Uh, we have a business unit. 1%, that's what we're doing at the moment. We're moving goods in Ireland 1% by rail. It's 20% plus in Europe, miles behind. We have to decarbonise the movement of goods around our roads network. Uh, this, rail freight, um, this rail freight business and the development of it is key. We need to develop the infrastructure. We're currently rebuilding a 42 kilometre line that was shut in 2000 from Limerick, just down the southwest, out to the port of Fines on the Shannon Estuary. Uh, we've started constructing that. Uh, that was closed 20 years ago. And again, that is with support from, from the government to create a network that's properly connected to our ports 
and gives us options on rail freight. Lastly, this is the, um, the long-term 2030, as I spoke about. 2040, then, is obviously there's a Project Ireland 2040 plan at government level. 2050, net zero. So really, we're talking about a decade of delivery, but we're really talking about three decades of delivery, and we need to get to that road program we spoke about earlier. Absolutely crucial if we want to get there, and that's going to be, take a lot of capital. <coughs> Over and above the projects I've already talked about, we see it being as a minimum 20 billion. Therefore, you're looking at 800 to a billion a year over that timeline if we want to achieve the goal to decarbonise the railway, to decarbonise society, if we want to achieve the climate action plan that everybody's working towards. That's it for me. Thanks for listening.